Friends, Phil Cookman here. Friendly Phil, they call me. And you're watching the Green Handshake channel. Friends, has this ever happened to you? Let's say you're watching JW Broadcasting and you see something like this. Well, that's quite the situation to be in. What was your thought process through that? What, what did you decide to do, given those circumstances? So the first thing I did was pray. I prayed and prayed. And while doing research, I came across an article in uh, December 1st, 2004 issue of The Watchtower, which was entitled, Trusting in Jehovah's Care. In that article, there was a quote that said, we should plan ahead as if Armageddon would not come in our lifetime, but live our life as if it would come tomorrow. Well, that was the answer I needed. So. Well, as you're meditating on the scene that night, you're thinking, huh, what does that mean? We should plan ahead as if Armageddon would not come in our lifetime. Well, I guess I better plan for my retirement, right? I'm going to need enough money to last me and my family until I'm 90 years old. Okay, so, how are we looking? I mean, maybe it's not looking so hot right now. Maybe I'm working part-time cleaning the windows so I can pioneer. And I'm saying, hey, I'm 25 years old, no problem cleaning the windows. But if I'm going to do what the Watchtower says and plan ahead as if Armageddon isn't coming in my lifetime, it's good at 25, but what about when I'm 85 years old? I don't think I'll be cleaning the windows so good. Maybe I gotta face the facts and say, hey, if I couldn't clean the windows for two weeks right now, I'd be in some serious financial difficulty. Fact is, by worldly standards, my family's kind of poor. I realize, of course, it's no shame to be poor, but it's no great honor either. Now I know you're saying, hey, friendly Phil, come on. Money isn't the key to happiness. I heard that plenty of people won the lottery and their lives suck now. Okay, I hear what you're saying, and that's true. You don't need a million bucks to be happy. But you gotta have some money, right? Okay, so, how much? Well, some scientists, they wanted to figure it out, right? So check out this article on Inc.com. There was a study in 2018. They checked how much dough people were making, and then they had them rate their happiness. It says... The research essentially confirmed past studies that found around 70000 bucks was an ideal income for providing day-to-day -day happiness in the United States. But it also expanded the work globally using data from the Gallup World Poll. The researchers found that while regions with lower living standards and cost of living like Eastern Europe and Latin America reached peak happiness at a lower amount of income, the global average still worked out to between $60,000 and $75,000. Okay, so now we know. That's pretty interesting, right? 70 grand a year for the happiness. Now, don't get me wrong, you don't want to go too high neither. It says, in Canada and the United States, an income of 105,000 provides the most life satisfaction. Well, globally, the ideal average income is 95,000. The study found that exceeding these income thresholds actually seems to reduce levels of happiness and satisfaction. This could be because higher income earners are more driven by material gains and social comparisons that can ironically lower those levels. Okay, so now we know. You gotta be making 70 to 100 grand for peak happiness. Not much less, not much more. So, I ask you, how much are you making? Well, I'm just gonna say it. There ain't too many JWs making 70 grand, right? Check out this Pew Research study from 2014. They surveyed how much everybody's making in the U.S. and sorted it by religion. Jewish and Hindu folks are doing the best up at the top. So where's JWs? Bad news, guys. JWs are last on the list for income. It says 73% of JWs make less than 50 grand a year. That's 20 grand less than what correlates with peak happiness. And keep in mind that 70 grand, that was for one person. It'd be a little more if you got a family. So if you're a witness and you want to follow JW.org's advice and plan like Armageddon's not coming in your lifetime, maybe you got some work to do. Or maybe you just got out of a high demand religion and same deal, the finances need some work. Well, that's where I come in. 
I'm Friendly Phil. I'm going to give you some tips to achieve financial freedom so you're not still cleaning the windows outside in the winter when you're 85 years old. But don't get me wrong. I didn't dream up this advice, okay? Watchtower doesn't just tell you to plan like Armageddon's not coming in your lifetime and that's that. It also gives people the tips to achieve their financial freedom. Now, don't worry, this isn't going to be one of those YouTubes where people just read a bunch of quotes from the Watchtower for their videos. I mean, come on, you're putting me to sleep over here. Nah, we're going to look at real life examples of what the Watchtower Society does, the steps to take for financial freedom. And then at the end, we're going to look at a case study, an active witness who put these steps into action and how it all worked out for him. Now, the first thing you got to think, how to make that 70 grand a year. Option one, you can work 80 hours a week and make that, but then you got no time left for spiritual activities. So we can see you need a good paying job. Okay, so you're probably going to need a college education. Now don't get me wrong, there's plenty of plumbers making 70 grand a year with no college. So think about the trades. Just keep in mind, it's some physical work, right? You're still going to want to be strapping on knee pads when you're 50 years old. Maybe not so much. So maybe you need to start your own plumbing business once you learn the ropes so you can get those young bucks to do the grunt work when you're pushing 50. So option number one, apprentice to a trade, maybe start your own business. Okay, option two, go to college. Now, 70 grand a year is 1350 a week. Okay, check out this chart from the book Personal Finance by Jack Kapoor. This is the median income for each college degree. Half the incomes are lower, half the incomes are higher. It don't take a rocket scientist to see you're probably going to need at least a bachelor's degree and probably a master's degree to make $13.50 a week. But pick a good degree, right? You pick a degree in English literature, you might not be pulling down seventy grand even with a master's degree. And with a nursing degree, you can probably pull down seventy grand even with a two-year degree. So pick judiciously. Now, going to college is not such a hot idea according to the Watchtower Society, right? They mention it all the time. And that council works. Check out this other chart from Pew Research. It's people's education sorted by their religion. And there's JWs way down near the bottom. Only 12% of JWs have a college degree. In fact, 20% don't even have a high school diploma. But remember, in this video, we're not looking at the words of Watchtower. Like the new study guide Enjoy Life Forever says, actions speak louder than words. So, let's look at an example of what Watchtower does, because then we know what to do. Okay, this is a Bethelite named Philip Brumley. He's got my name, so you gotta like the guy, right? So what did he do for college? Let's check it out. How did it come about that you came to work in the legal department? Um, so I was uh, working in the carpenter shop one day and I got a telephone call from Brother Charles Steele. Uh, the governing body asked Brother Steele uh, who could go through law school to become an attorney. The organization needed a few attorneys to help defend the rights of Jehovah's Witnesses. So Brother Steele asked me, or basically gave me the assignment, uh, we want you to become a lawyer. So the organization made a decision to send you through law school. Because when I graduated, I graduated uh, cum laude, which means in the top 10% of the class. So check it out. First, Philip was learning a trade as an apprentice in the carpentry shop. That was our option one. Then he goes for option two, a college degree, specifically to become an attorney at law. Now, if you want to go to college, great, but there's some things you got to keep in mind. The number one thing is college can cost a lot of dough. Student loans can be a killer. You will invariably have to be paying off significant student debt. Philip Brumley went to law school at Brooklyn Law School. It was just down the street from Brooklyn Bethel. Currently, the tuition is sixty-five grand a year there, and it's a three-year program. That's a lot of simoleons. So, keep your college costs down as much as possible. Philip B. did his bachelor's degree at a public state school, SUNY Albany. That's a good idea. Public universities are way cheaper than private schools. In fact, you should actually go the next step and try to do your first two years of college at a community college, which is probably going to be half the cost of a public four-year college, which is half the cost of a private university. Here's another tip. Check out tuition reimbursement from your employer. 
Lots of employers will give you a few thousand bucks each year for tuition. That's what Philip did. In fact, his employer paid for his college 100%. Now, it's usually hard to find that much reimbursement except maybe the military. But hey, every little bit helps. Now, the catch is most places want you to work there for a while after they give you the tuition reimbursement. That's how Watchtower does it in their program. In fact, Philip is still there 30 years later. Now, I'm sure the work requirement wasn't 30 years, but he must like it. In fact, he's now head of the legal department for Watchtower. So, not such a bad gig. Another tip. Philip probably didn't need to do this, but definitely check out scholarships you may qualify for. The financial aid department at your college can help you to do that. But even if you do need to take out some student loans, the return on investment over several decades of working at the higher salaries is probably still going to be worth it. Okay, let's look at another tip from Watchtower. One form of investment is investing in real estate. This is something the Organization of Jehovah's Witnesses is very good at. Let's check out an example. Between 2013 and 2016, they completed the sale of a major building complex in Brooklyn, New York, the property at 25 and 30 Columbia Heights. They were able to sell the property for 340 million bucks. Now that's a lot of chimichangas. One of the buyers in the investment group that bought the property was Jared Kushner, CEO of Kushner Companies. As part of the deal, Watchtower had him sit down for an interview about how it was working with the Watchtower Society. Let's check it out. On October 2nd, 2013, Jehovah's Witnesses finalized the sale of a five-building complex that represented a major part of their history in Brooklyn, New York. Over the course of 77 years, uh, these buildings were used to print and produce Bibles and other Bible-based materials in at least 180 different languages. Uh, so in terms of Bible education and the importance of the Bible message, uh, these buildings were quite significant to Jehovah's Witnesses. The five-building complex was sold to RFR and Kushner Companies. Jared Kushner, CEO of Kushner Companies, is one of the new owners. We own, you know, probably close to 200 buildings, and we uh, obviously have toured, you know, many thousands uh, over my short career. Uh, and I say that my whole team was very impressed with the immaculate shape in which the buildings have been kept. The maintenance that, that the organization has done over the years was really incredible, so we're buying some really first-rate buildings. These properties are situated really right between uh, in what they call the Brooklyn Tech Triangle, and if we can activate these properties in the right way, they have the ability to really be the heart of that triangle and to connect downtown with Dumbo, with what's happening in the Navy Yards, and really be the epicenter for all the change uh, that is occurring in Brooklyn. Mr. Kushner also comments on what it was like to purchase the buildings from Jehovah's Witnesses. I would say that the, the people I've dealt with have all been, I'd say number, for, first and foremost, of high integrity. Uh, you know, a handshake means something with the witnesses. It's much easier to transact with a group where there's a high level of trust. And it's always nice to see when so many people are working for a cause and, and really trust each other and are, you know, very competent at what they do. The witnesses have been moving ahead with their relocation plans. Brooklyn. That's a nice video, right? Jared Kushner has a lot of good things to say about Jehovah's Witnesses. It is very perplexing to me that after taking the time to make this nice video, it is no longer available on JW.org. It is very strange because Jared Kushner went on to become even more famous. In fact, a senior advisor to a U.S. president, his father-in-law, President Donald Trump. Well, what you gonna do? Okay, so Kushner and the other investors paid 340 million bucks to Watchtower. Now, how much did Watchtower have invested in 25 and 30 Columbia Heights? In the September 1st, 89 Watchtower, Max Larson wrote his life story. He was a senior Bethelite involved in almost all of Watchtower Society's real estate purchases in Brooklyn. On page 28, he describes buying 25 Columbia Heights together with the Society's third president, Nathan Knorr. He writes, Brother Knorr and I got together and determined what price we thought we would pay. At the meeting the next day, we were told the price was non-negotiable. We want $3 million in cash, they said. We tried not to look surprised. 
since that was considerably lower than what we were prepared to offer. Needless to say, the purchase was promptly made. Okay, so Watchtower paid three million bucks in 1969, or in 2016 dollars, 19.6 million dollars. They sold it for 340 million dollars. If I am calculating correctly, that is a 1,734% return on investment, or an average annual return of about 35% per year for the 50 years Watchtower owned the property. Now, 35% annual return? Not too shabby. You might be thinking, that's five times what I can get on the stock market. Time to jump into real estate. Well, hold your horses there, buckaroo. Note two things in particular. Watchtower spent three million bucks on this purchase. That's one thing about real estate. It often requires big bucks to invest. And number two, the society kept the property for 50 years. That's a long time. If they tried to sell it two years after they bought it, it is highly unlikely they would be making a 70% return. So real estate investing is often measured in decades. Now, that being said, it can be a very good investment, especially if you're involved with rental properties like Jared Kushner is. One way to get involved if you don't have 3 million bucks is in REITs, Real Estate Investment Trusts. It's sort of like buying stocks, except it's real estate. Another way most people invest in real estate is buying a house to live in. Now there's pros and cons of buying versus renting, but it's one of the most common ways to follow Watchtower's example and invest in the real estate. Once you buy a house to live in, another option is buying a second property to rent out. Is it okay for JWs to do this? Absolutely. In fact, we can follow the example of governing body member Stephen Lett. Stephen is a very good example because he doesn't just instruct other witnesses on JW Broadcasting, he also faithfully follows the advice of the organization to live as if Armageddon wasn't coming in his lifetime. In 2013, after he had been serving on the governing body for 13 years, he bought a waterfront investment property on the Gulf Coast with his wife Susan and his brother Tim. As the deed here shows, they paid 500000 bucks for this home. You will note the deed uses his full legal name, Mark Stephen Lett. He goes by his middle name Stephen since his father was also named Mark. The deed explains that this was not a house for Tim or Stephen to live in. It was for income potential. If we go on the Baldwin County, Alabama website today, we can see that the Letts still own this property. That's because Stephen isn't a property flipper. He knows his stuff. He's following the society's example of holding real estate for a long period of time. That is how Stephen will make the most profit from the cash he initially invested. So, if you happen to be watching as a faithful JW, you will want to consider how you can follow Stephen's example in your own life. Now, it's true that real estate investing is kind of a more advanced part of achieving financial freedom. So in our next installment, we will discuss some more basic tips from the Watchtower Society on how to successfully live as if Armageddon is not coming in our lifetime. Although basic, these tips will still be super important. Until then, it's Friendly Phil saying, bye-bye. <laughs>